Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Dallas Volunteer Attorney Program CLE on how to do a no kids divorce. My name is Kristen Salas. I am one of two mentor attorneys of the Dallas Volunteer Attorney Program, or DVAP for short. Our other mentor attorney is Catherine Saldana. And for those of you that are not familiar with our program, we are a joint program with Legal Aid of Northwest Texas and the Dallas Bar. And our primary mission is to match low income Dallas residents with private attorneys that will do their civil case pro bono. One of the biggest types of cases that we see throughout our history has been family law. And of family law cases, the most common types we get are divorces. And if you've never taken a family law or even a litigation case before, I think one of the easiest ways to get started doing pro bono is to do a no kids, no property divorce. So we are blessed to have Elaine Mosier with us today to tell us all about how to do these types of divorces. Um, Elaine has got her JD from Texas Tech. She's actually a former managing attorney for DVAP, and currently she is a sole practitioner and mediator that specializes in family law and animal law. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Elaine. Thank you so much, Kristen. I appreciate it. Um, as Kristen stated, I'm Elaine Mosier, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, this obviously is directed at people who are not experienced in, as Kristen said, in litigation or family law in general. And a no kids, no property or little property divorce is a great way to get your feet wet um, in figuring out or navigating the system of uh, basic litigation. And frankly, if any of you are interested in doing family law, doing a pro bono divorce is a great way to get your feet wet and do it in such a way that you're going to have lots of support and help because Kristen is available to assist you. Um, Kathy is also available to assist you. There are other mentor attorneys out in the universe who are willing to assist you and frankly, if you speak to the court, um, the court's coordinator or the court clerks, and you let them know that you're doing a divorce on a pro bono basis, they also will be super helpful and step in to give you any assistance that you're going to need. Now, as we live in the world of COVID, um, rather than having to go to the courthouse as you used to do, to finalize a divorce case. All of that is typically happening by submission now where you simply prepare um, an affidavit for your client to submit at the end of the case. But let me not jump ahead. Let's start out that when you receive your packet from um, DVAP, they have kindly done a lot of the work for you that you typically need to do with your client if they were just coming into your office to meet with you and say, hey, I'm here, I want, I'm interested in getting a divorce and you need to pull the information from them that you need for the divorce. In all of the DVAP cases, all the good information has already been pulled by DVAP. Um, they will typically also include what's called an affidavit of inability to pay costs in the packet that you receive. What this does is allows you to file the divorce without your client having to pay any of the filing fees, which at this time is around the $300 mark for a no kids, no property divorce. Um, so the first thing that you will actually have to do is take the forms that have been filled out by your client with DVAP that have their name, their spouse's name, um, their address, hopefully the spouse's address, um, the date of their marriage, the date of their separation, and that is the information essentially that you need 
in order to get started with the original petition for divorce. And the original petition for divorce, if you don't have a form for it, you can contact DVAP. They have the form available. Actually, they have all the forms that you need for your divorce available. The original petition for divorce, um, the waiver of service. And let me just explain again, if you're not uh, familiar with litigation, anytime you file a civil suit, the other side, in this case, in a, in a divorce, the spouse has to be served or file a waiver, essentially saying that I know that typically I would have to be served, but in this case, I will instead sign this document and have it notarized that says, I understand that there's a divorce on file and I've received a copy of the original petition for divorce, but I have chosen instead to file a waiver. Um, Maticella is going to forward y'all a service checklist that I try and keep in my files because um, sometimes you rock along in a divorce, you get your original petition filed and you're, you are thinking, okay, my time period's coming up when I can finalize the divorce. And for whatever reason, service wasn't completed. So I just find it helpful to keep something in my file that reminds me to check on service because service can be completed in several ways. There is service of process that can be completed by the sheriff. And that's literally where they go out, uh, you know, knock on somebody's door and hand them the citation and a copy of the original petition for divorce. It can also be completed by the clerks sending out certified mail return receipt requested. And essentially in that situation, if you have a very good address for the spouse and your client has assured you 10 million times that their spouse will actually receive the mail and sign for it, then you can attempt to do it by certified mail. I will tell you that I have never, I have been doing this for over 25 years. I have never, ever, ever had success with service by certified mail. This is, and this is the, the reason that I'm kind of harping on service is because you have to have that in order for your case to move forward. If you never get the spouse served, then there are some other things that you can do. For example, you can try and notify the spouse by what's called publication or by what's called posting. And that's in essence where you have your client prepare an affidavit that says, you know, I'm going to say her name is Jane Brown. Uh, my name is Jane Brown and I'm married to John Brown. And I have not seen my spouse since 2005. And I've called all of his relatives. I've called all of his friends that I knew of back in 2005. And nobody, and everybody tells me they don't know where, where um, John Brown is. In that case, what you are doing is requesting that the court order that John Brown be cited. In this case, since we are focusing on a no kids, no property divorce, that John Brown is noticed by what's called posting. And that is literally where a sheriff takes the citation and posts it up on a board that they maintain in the courthouse. This is that... This comes to us from the 18th century tradition that pretty much all business that was conducted in a town was conducted in or near the courthouse. And so everybody would see courthouse postings. We, of course, now know that that's absolutely not true, that 
there are many people who live their entire lives in a, in a county without ever going to the courthouse, but that fiction still exists. So if your client comes to you and they don't have an address on their spouse, there are ways that you can get around that, the posting or the publication. The other thing that you need to remember, and I'm going to tell you that DVAP is going to double check this for you, but just it's always good to double check it yourself, is the code requires that before you file a divorce, that a person has lived in the state of Texas for at least six months prior to the filing of the divorce and in the county where you're filing, in this case, Dallas County, for at least 90 days. Now, this is important that you think about the fact that it's prior to the filing. So you can't say to your client, well, if you've only lived in Texas for five months, but by the time we get the divorce done, you'll have been here for six months, that's okay. We can go ahead and file. Not true. It, it literally, the six-month period has to be prior to the filing of the divorce. And the same for the 90 days. They have to have been in Dallas County for at least 90 days prior to the filing of the suit. And again, because DVAP is good, they've already checked that for you, but it's always good to just confirm that with your client. One of the other things that I always check when you have the wife, and typically your DVAP clients, just generally they tend to be female because a Females tend to be, I'm going to say, the poorer sex. Um, so you always want to check with your client. Your, what we're talking about is no kids divorces. So one of the things that you want to check on is make sure that your client hasn't had any kiddos with someone other than their spouse. Now, we don't care if husband... He can go out and father as many kids as he wants during a marriage, and it doesn't affect the, the ability to get a divorce. But if the wife has had children outside of their marriage, again, I'm going to use Jane Brown and John Brown. So let's say that, that Jane and John have been divorced, or excuse, excuse me, have been separated since 2005. And since 2005, Jane went out and had a baby with Tom. Well, that baby is presumed to be John's baby. So if Jane hasn't gone and gotten paternity established between Tom and that baby that she had, that is not a no kids divorce. And you probably, if this is your first divorce, I would strongly suggest that you send that back to DVAP and say, hey, I was talking with my client and she told me that she had had a baby that was a baby by another man, not her husband. And I, you know, so I think I need to send this back to you. And you do. Um, because there has to be, the court requires that you either establish that child is a child of the marriage or that paternity has been established with the true father. Um, so I'm going to go back to my, my rendition of getting your divorce done. You've gotten your papers from DVAP. You have talked to your client and you've confirmed you don't have any kids that were born outside of the marital relationship. You have discussed with your client whether she lived in the state of Texas and the county of Dallas for the six months for Texas and the 90 days for Dallas, and you've figured out the date of marriage and the date of separation. And I will tell you that based on my experience with some of my pro bono clients and frankly, some of my not pro bono clients, there are people who have a really, really difficult time remembering when they got married and when they separated. So sometimes that discussion is a little longer than you would think it would be. You, you sometimes have to draw them out and say, 
okay, when you got married, do you remember, was it cold outside? Was it hot outside? Were your friends there? Was your mom present? Is there somebody you could call and double check with? Um, so once you get that, then you're ready to file your original petition for divorce. And the original petition in Texas is an extremely simple document. It, it, in Texas, we have what are called notice pleadings only. What that means is you are simply providing the necessary information to notice the spouse that a divorce is on file. By that, I mean, you do not have to include in the original petition, let's say, for example, that your client tells you that the reason that she and her husband separated in 2005 was because her husband was abusive, had tried to rape her, uh, just, you know, sometimes you really hear terrible stories from people. All that information does not need to be included in the divorce. In Texas, all of that information would come out if you were going to have either a temporary hearing or a final trial. It doesn't need to be included in the original petition. What the original petition needs to include is the names of the parties spelled correctly. Make your client double check the spelling of their name before you file the original petition for divorce. It is often extremely difficult to get the clerks to change the spelling of the name once the original petition has been submitted. Even if you go back later and your client says, oh, the, uh, you know, the T and the E are transposed in my name. It's, it can sometimes be very painful to get the clerks to get that changed. You have to do an order that modifies what's entered into the clerk's record. And it's just, um, it's a pain. So just get your client to double, triple check the spelling of their name and the spelling of their spouse's name on the original petition. Then once the original petition is filed, hopefully your client and your client's spouse are on good enough terms that the spouse would sign the waiver of service. The waiver of service is a statement, again, that states that the spouse that is being served understands that typically Texas requires personal service in a divorce case, but they are choosing to waive personal service. That document cannot be signed prior to the filing of the divorce. If the waiver is signed prior to the filing of the divorce, the waiver is invalid. Now, there are some other pieces that y'all need to know about the waiver that prevent it from being invalid. One, the waiver must include the full name of the respondent. So if it's John Brown and his middle name is, if he's John Ellis Brown, on the waiver, it needs to say John Ellis Brown. It needs to have his accurate and full address, meaning it can't be 1415 Elm Street, Dallas County, Texas. It's got to be 1415 Elm Street, Dallas, Dallas County, Texas. And the zip is preferred, although there is some case law out there that says the zip is not fatal. So those are two things that you must double check. One, that, that your filing date is at least one day prior to the signing of the waiver. Also, the waiver must be notarized. So let's say you talk to your client and you say, do you think that John will sign a waiver of service? And your client says, oh, yeah, yeah, he's as anxious to get divorced as I am. Great. So you get your original petition filed. You then email or have your client come in person. 
you email a copy of the file stamped original petition for divorce along with a blank waiver. And when I say blank, I mean, it has the header for the divorce, the cause number, the names of the two parties, the court to which the divorce is assigned, and the that it's a Dallas County divorce. And I typically type in the respondent's full name and I have my client double check the spelling of his or her full name. I have them, if they know the address, I fill that in. If they don't know the address, I leave a blank line so that John can write it. But it cannot be signed until John gets in front of a notary. You got to tell your client that over and over again. Don't take this to John and let him sign it until the two of you are in front of the notary. Because if it's signed prior to being in front of the notary, most notaries will not notarize it. So that means you've, you know, you've wasted the waiver and you may not be able to get John to do it again. So just tell your client, you know, they need to get John and go with him to the notary. And then John signs. The other thing that John's going to need is some sort of ID when he goes to the notary. Most notaries require a driver's license or state ID. Now, a, an ID from jail um, following incarceration is a valid ID in Texas. Your passport is always a valid ID in Texas. But those are pretty much the only forms of acceptable ID to most notaries your driver's license, a state ID, a jail ID. And the jail ID typically has to be less than a year old because most notaries are like, well, you should have gone and gotten a state ID by now if you've been out for a year um, or your passport. So take that with, make sure that your client confirms that those forms of ID, one of those forms of ID goes with their spouse to the notary. Then once you've gotten the waiver back, have your client bring it to you or mail it to you because when you e-file the waiver, everything now is required to be e-filed in Dallas County. When you e-file the waiver, you are saying to the court that you have a live copy of the actual waiver in your file. So, Typically, I ask my client to meet me with the waiver once it's been signed. Then that way you can double check it and make sure that it's accurate. And then immediately go ahead and file it with the court. Because once the waiver is on file, that notifies the court that service is complete. Then the next thing that you start working on is your final decree of divorce. And again, whatever cause number the clerks assigned to the case is carried forward on every document after the original petition is filed. It's carried forward on the waiver if the spouse is willing to sign a waiver, and it's carried forward on the final decree of divorce once you're ready to finalize the divorce. The final decree of divorce is the magic paper that actually gets you divorced in Texas. Now, Texas is a no-fault divorce state, and the ground for no-fault divorce is that the marriage has become insupportable due to discord or conflict between the parties such that the marital relationship cannot be saved. So, most divorces with no kids and no property are granted on the basis of, insta of insupportability. Sometimes no kids and no property divorces are granted on other grounds, abandonment, um, cruelty, cruelty is if there's been domestic violence, but here's what I'm going to say to you. If you're trying to get an agreed divorce done 
between two parties who perhaps have been separated for a long time, it is often much easier to get the other party to sign off on the documents if you simply use the ground of insupportability rather than attempting one of the other fault grounds that are available <clears throat> because people don't want to acknowledge that they have some fault in the divorce. So it, they, they often become very reluctant to sign off on the divorce documents if they see that it's, um, that the divorce is being granted on, for example, the ground of cruelty or on the ground of abandonment. They, uh, that tends to pay, make people mad and they suddenly start saying, no, I'm not agreeing to this divorce. You can just take me to court and things of that sort. And typically a client that comes into legal aid is real interested in getting their divorce finalized. Actually, typically a client that comes into any lawyer's office and asks for divorce wants to get their divorce done at, as quickly as they are able. Oh, and speaking of quickly as able, I'm just going to remind everybody that in Texas, there is a 60 day waiting period from the date of filing until the date that your divorce can be finalized. So that means the day that you submit the original petition for divorce to the clerks, you have to then count 60 days and on the 61st day it your the divorce could potentially be finalized so during that 60 day period is when you're asking your client to go and get the waiver signed or keep keep in your in your folder or put it on your calendar when you send a waiver to someone I typically give them about 20 days to get that waiver resolved. If they haven't resolved it in 20 days, then you need to go back to the clerks through the e-filing system. And, and the easiest way to do this is you prepare a letter to the clerks that say, I did not ask for citation when this divorce was filed. I now need citation to be issued and here is a copy of the file stamp divorce. When you file your letter with the clerks, submit a copy of the divorce as an attachment, excuse me, the file stamp divorce, uh, original petition as an attachment, because the clerks, although they have access to it, act like they don't. And so the easiest way to go ahead and get the clerks to issue citation Oh, and every time, because this is pro bono, every time you submit a request for which you would be charged, you click on waiver of fees and reattach the file stamped affidavit of inability to pay costs that you've gotten from DVAP. Um, because typically what you do is when you file your original petition, you file the affidavit of inability to pay costs as a separate lead document. That way it's separate in the divorce filings and it's not just attached to your original petition. The reason that you want that is if you have to go back and get citation issued, which costs money, you have a separate file stamped affidavit of inability that you can submit that shows that your client should not be charged for them issuing citation. You also, again, typically since this is a pro bono divorce case, you are going to ask that the sheriff serve the spouse. This is in our waivers not gonna work situations. And you want, when you submit the request for your citation, you need to give an accurate address to the clerks for where the other side can be served and it can only be one address. For example, you can't say, 
Well, you could either serve him at his mom's house, 1415 Elm Street, Dallas, Texas, or you could serve him at his job, 1515 Riverfront, also in Dallas, Texas, because there might be two separate sheriff's offices that service those two separate addresses. So you can only submit one address at a time. And the waiver, excuse me, the um, affidavit of inability to pay costs also waives the fees for the sheriff serving the citation on the respondent. Oh, and that's another thing. If you are new to divorce world, you may be used to like from law school hearing um, petitioner and defendant in divorces, they're respondents. They're not defendants. Um, and the, the my understanding is that the legislature did that years ago to make it sound less offensive when people are getting divorced. They didn't like the concept that somebody was a defendant in a divorce. So the respondent is always the responding party. Now, I'm going to touch on another subject that is hated um, among many family lawyers because it, it is the automatic discovery rules that are now in effect for any case filed as of January 1, 2021. I'm not gonna go on uh, over the rules in details except to say that if you file an original petition for divorce, and you have the respondent served with citation and the respondent files an answer to that citation, the answer triggers the automatic discovery rules within 30 days of, file, of the filing of the answer. I am going to tell you that is another reason to try, 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 try to get the respondent to sign a waiver because the waiver doesn't trigger the automatic discovery rules the way that an answer does. Because if an answer is filed, you have 30 days from the date the answer is filed to provide the first set of automatic discovery to the respondent. Now, it's typically a few months of bank statements, a retirement statement, if anybody has retirement. Um, oh gosh, I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me, but it's it's usually just bank statements and retirement statements that are required. You can look under Rule 190 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, and it has, and make sure you're looking at the new 190 um, because the legislature has changed it a couple of times since they first. Um, instituted it, but you can review Rule 190 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure and it will give you the specific items that are required to be provided once an answer is filed. Now, because this is pro bono and likely people don't have significant property, a lot of the things that are required by 190 may not even be available to you. You know, you may ask your client, um, hey, you need to go to your HR and get a copy of what your retirement, what the value of your retirement plan was when the two of you got married, what the value of your retirement plan is, you know, this quarter. And they may say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't have any kind of retirement with my job. In which case, you know, you can't provide it. Also, I had many, many, many pro bono clients who never had a bank account. They, they didn't have enough money to have to worry about having a bank account because uh, you know, the money in the hip pocket was what they were using every day to live on. So some of it may not be applicable, but just know that even though it's a pro bono case and even though they may not have a lot of stuff, the rules of civil procedure still require that you 
either send out the items or send out a letter notifying the other side that none of the items required by 190 um, are applicable to your client. That your client doesn't have any bank accounts, your client doesn't have a retirement account, those kinds of things. So um, just be cognizant of that fact as well, that if you have to have the respondent served and if the respondent files an answer, and, and just to remind everybody, this, this may have come to you at some point during law school, but it, believe me, it didn't absorb in my brain until I started actually practicing. Anything counts as an answer that isn't a waiver. The courts view virtually any response by a respondent during a divorce case as an answer. It's, you know, even if it doesn't have the cause number on it, if it doesn't have the proper names, if it just says, I hate her, the courts still take it as an answer. Now, if, if you have a case where the respondent does, does not sign the waiver and you have the respondent served and the respondent files an answer, then you either need to get the respondent to sign off on the final decree of divorce or you're going to have to set the case for a pretrial so that the court can determine what the issues are at trial. And sometimes the issue at trial is, I hate her, I'm trying to make things as difficult for her as I possibly can. So it's, it's not that they own anything. It's not that a trial is going to be a fight over anything. It is merely going to be a chance for sometimes the respondent or sometimes the petitioner to vent about how awful the other person was. I, I will tell y'all that the very first trial I ever had in my life was in a divorce case and it, it was, in fact, a pro bono divorce. And we had a trial over a, an area rug that was purchased at Walmart and a um, ceiling fan that was some type of ceiling fan that you don't actually have to wire into the ceiling. It was something that I think it stuck to the ceiling and was battery operated so that you removed it when you left like apartments or, or rental properties. Um, and I think the total value in the research that I did was um, $75 for both the rug and the fan. And I had a trial, uh, granted only a 30 minute trial over it, but the court set it for trial because the respondent would not agree to give up the rug and the fan and the petitioner, my client, would not agree to give up the rug or the fan. So what we did is we had a trial with each of them saying why they should get the rug and the fan. And then I'm going to tell you what the court did, which is what the courts very typically do. Gave one of them the rug, gave the other one the fan, and said because it happened to be my client that was still living in the rental property where they had lived during their marriage, said, ma'am, you get the rug, he gets the fan, and he gets to come in on this date certain and get the fan from the ceiling and, and take it with it. And so we then had a court order that I could prepare that was the final decree of divorce, and the court made the finding that the, that the divorce would be based upon the grounds of insupportability. Um, because the judge, my client said that there was domestic violence and the judge heard testimony from both the petitioner and the respondent and basically said, I'm finding that both of you committed domestic violence toward each other. So I'm just going to grant on the ground of insupportability. I'm not going to make a finding of family violence as to either one of you. And of course, it was a case where there were no children. 
And so the reality of the need for a finding of family violence was inconsequential. So just be, be prepared and I'm not trying to drive you away because I'm, I'm literally telling you that 90% of the divorces that you're gonna get from DVAP are going to be very straightforward. You're gonna file an original petition. The other side, if they can be found, are going to be willing to sign off on a waiver. And then you're going to prepare a very straightforward final decree of divorce, which Kristen or Kathy can give you a very easy, straightforward final decree of divorce that simply says, petitioner keeps all of her personal property. Maybe you're going to have to put, she keeps the, you know, 2015, Honda Civic or whatever with this VIN number and he keeps the 2012 Chevrolet something or other and here's the VIN number. It, But it's typically, it's going to be extremely straightforward. There's not going to be any of that argument that I just described where, uh, you know, there were two people that were not able to figure it out and we had a 30 minute trial over a rug and a and a ceiling fan. That's that is very typically not the kind of divorce that you get from DVAP. Now, I, I mentioned just briefly if you can find the respondent, sometimes folks come to you from DVAP, and and this is I'm going back to Jane Brown and John Brown again, and they separated in 2005. It's been 16 years since these folks separated. Sometimes you just can't find the spouse anymore. And I, and I mentioned briefly that if that's the case, if it's a no kids and no significant property case, you can do what's called citation by posting. If there is significant property, meaning a house, and sometimes pro bono cases do involve a small house, then if there is a house, you have to utilize publication, not posting. Again, if this is your first divorce case, I would strongly suggest that if you find out that your client owns a house or is purchasing a home, that you send that case back to DVAP and say, hey, this is not a simple, no kids, no property. This lady owns a house. I, I think I'd like to trade you for one that's just a straightforward, no significant property, no real property at all, and no kiddos. Just because publication can be a bit more complicated and then confirming in the final decree of divorce, the award of the real property needs to be done in, in a rather particular way with the um, legal description of the property being very thorough and complete so that your client actually ends up with the real property that you're attempting to award them. So I would just suggest that if this is your first divorce, that perhaps it would be easier if you sent the divorce back if it does include any real property. Um, but I will say this, if if there is a little house or a little piece of land somewhere and you want to give it a shot, Kristen and Kathy are great mentors and they will absolutely help you with, um, <coughs> excuse me, they will absolutely help you with that. And they will absolutely help by reviewing your final decree of divorce to make sure that the document includes the division of property and awards the real property in the correct way. So again, if you are thinking that you might be interested in doing some family law and you'd like to get your feet wet, pro bono can be a great, great way to get your feet wet where you have two fantastic mentors that work there, you know, 24 seven, and there are other mentors that are available 
uh, myself included, um, that you can contact and say, hey, I have this, you know, weird situation. Uh, can you help me out with it? So um, one of the one of the things that you need to remember is, if, and I know I keep going back to this, is asking your client questions. Because one of the worst things that can happen is you get through the divorce, you get either to the final decree stage or God forbid, even past the final decree stage and your client comes back or calls you and says, <coughs> oh, I, I forgot to tell you, you know, I own this little house that I inherited from my mom and, um, you know, I don't live there because I have just been letting my cousin live there, but it's really, it's my house and I inherited it and I inherited it during the marriage. Ah, that needs to be confirmed as your client's separate property. Because in every divorce, just, just to kind of give you a, a quick idea of what you're dealing with in a divorce, in every single divorce, there are three estates. There is the separate property of the petitioner, the separate property of the respondent, and the community property, meaning everything that accrued or came to someone during the marriage. Everybody has a little separate property. I don't care if it's just this music box that your grandmother gave you. That those items need to be confirmed as separate property if it's something that your client wants to make sure that they're going to get as part of the divorce division. Now, when people have been separated for a long time before they come to you, that makes that easier because typically they don't have anything that's still in a place that they live together. But you always want to confirm as much of the property as you can, just so that later there's not an argument about a car because it wasn't awarded, or there's not an argument about the area rug or the ceiling fan because it wasn't awarded. So one of the things that I often ask my clients to do is I will say, what are the things that you absolutely want to get out of your divorce? And I ask them to write them down for me so that when I do the decree, I literally, I can say, you know, petitioner Jane Brown is awarded the following. All of her personal property, her clothing, shoes, other items of personal care, and then the bookshelf from the living room the music box from her grandmother that she keeps jewelry in, all the jewelry in the music box, so on and so forth. You want to list as much as you can so that you don't have a problem later. Um, especially if, let's say that you have to have the respondent served. This is the second most common kind of divorce that you're gonna find in pro bono cases. The first is the, we totally agree, we want to get divorced. I'm going to file the divorce. He's going to sign a waiver. We're going to both sign off on the final decree. Second most common type is a default divorce. That's where she, she files. You eventually get him served by a sheriff. And he just doesn't file an answer. There's just no response. It's just, you know, he... He took the citation and the copy of the divorce and like threw it over his shoulder, or threw it in the trash can or whatever. And so he just doesn't do anything about it. He wants to get divorced, but he doesn't care enough to actually participate. When you do a default divorce, you want to make sure that everything that your client wants or has in their possession, that it's listed. Otherwise, when you do a default, the time frames that somebody could come back to court and and protest the um, the divorce, uh, then they're going to say, "No, I should have been awarded this, or this wasn't awarded." 
And frankly, the this wasn't awarded will sometimes cause the court to say, okay, I'm going to give somebody a new trial so that we can award everything. Now, I see that I have talked until 1252. Thank you so much for your kind attention. If there are questions, I am, my understanding is I am able to open this Q&A box and answer them. Um, what happens when the clients say that they would do an agreement and one changes his mind later? Let's say they both signed the waiver before the 60th day. <coughs> excuse me, the respondent changes his mind. That would be contested, right? Yes. You are allowed as a respondent, if you sign the waiver anytime before the 60th day is up, you can then go ahead and file an answer or even just notify the attorney. I no longer agree. I signed the waiver, but I do not agree to finalizing the divorce. Now, um, this one is, can you talk about prove-ups, how they're being handled? Yes, prove-ups are now typically being handled by submission, meaning you create an affidavit with your client that says all the things that you typically would say in a prove-up. Example, um, you would do, what's your name? What's your spouse's name? What weren't you married on May 5th, 2003? Did you separate on May 5th, 2005? Has your marriage become insupportable due to discord or conflicts of a personality that destroys the legitimate ends of your marriage relationship? Yes, yes. In the affidavit, literally all those answers should be yes. And in the affidavit, you ask the question, will you be able to reconcile with your spouse? That's the only no answer. They then sign and have that affidavit notarized and you submit that to the court along with the signed decree of divorce. And then the judge will simply sign the, sign the order once the affidavit is submitted. submitted. Um, how do you handle situations where they can't determine the marriage or separation date? You can actually ask DVAP to send a request to the vital statistics in Austin, and you should be able to get the marriage date. They're going to have to figure out when they separated. They are just going to have to search their brains. Um, if the respondent is still located in another county, can you use a waiver? Yes. Um, it, but the divorce has to be filed in Dallas County. The waiver can be used. Even actually, if they live out of state, they can still sign a waiver. What do you recommend when the respondent is out of state or county and doesn't sign the waiver? You can get, you can still use a sheriff in another county to accept the affidavit of inability that you filed in Dallas County. So let's say that your client lives in, your respondent lives in Tarrant County. You can contact the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office Tell them that you have a divorce filed in Dallas. It's filed on affidavit of inability and you can actually mail them everything by snail mail and they will serve it as long as you mail it to the right sheriff's office um, because Tarrant County like Dallas has many sheriff's office that do service. It says, can you mail the waiver with a postage stamped envelope if the respondent is out of reach by petitioner? Um, you can, but... I would strongly recommend that you e-file it instead. It's very easy to create an e-filing account through the, the state of Texas e-file system. It says, what should I do if my client has advised me that the respondent will not sign the waiver because he disagrees with the amounts listed that petitioner has already claimed she pays or paid, I'm guessing. Um, what I would... What I would do if I were you is go ahead, file it, and have him served and see if he even answers. And yes, I will give you all my contact information. Let me do that right now because I think we only have about three minutes left. It's Elaine Mosier, M-O-S-H-E-R. My email is J-E-M, like Mary, M-O-S-H-E-R, at AOL.com. I do not have any fancy email address. 
it's like, and it's two M's together, J-E-M-M-O-S-H-E-R at AOL. And I'm also going to give you all my cell number. I love texts, so please feel free to text me. My cell is 214-538-6323. And that will allow, and, and you guys can text me and say, hey, what about this? What about this? I'm happy to answer. What if the petitioner has physical possession of things? Do you still need to include those in the decree to ensure that she will have it? Yes. What you can do if 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 the petitioner has got something or or the respondent has got something of petitioners or vice versa, what you need to do is put in the decree that it is awarded to the in this case the petitioner. We'll say Jane Brown. And you put a date certain by which John Brown is to release it to Jane Brown. Now, you may then have to go to court again to get the court to hold him in contempt for failing to release the item. But if you, if you do award, if you do award something, the chances of her getting it are way better. So um, I think we have no time or maybe one minute. And so I'm going to repeat my, um, I'm going to repeat my email and my cell number again, just so you guys can contact me. It's J-E-M-M-O-S-H-E-R at AOL. And my cell number is 214-538-6323. Well, we got one more question. If you need to write a letter to the court to have the sheriff serve the respondent, after respondent has not filed the waiver, do you e-file the letter along? Yes, you e-file the letter along with a co file stamp copy of the petition and a file stamp copy of the affidavit of inability to pay. Um, so the proof up is not done on Zoom, is just submitted via affidavit. Typically, they've been doing everything via affidavit. Now, since things are starting to open up a little bit, judges may want to start doing live proof ups again but as of right now the and the uh, the easiest way to check is call the clerks of the court to which your case is assigned and ask that's it the correction one is right jem mosier at aol um the, the easiest way to figure out what if your court is still using submission is call the clerks of the court and they'll tell you and again thank you all so much for attending today um, 